To discuss all of this and more with our featured guest of the morning, he's Gavin Graham. Gavin Graham is Chief Investment Officer at Smart B Investments. Joins us this morning from Kelowna, BC. Yes. Gavin, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, I guess markets had expected the news that uh, they are now digesting that a deal uh, would take place. What, what's your take on the events in Washington? Well, uh, thank you for having me, Paul. And it's obviously very good news uh, that the uh, deal has been done on the debt ceiling, even though, as noted in that piece, it's only till the end of uh, next year. But it does take us through the presidential election. It does keep the, the bills being paid. And more importantly, both sides have given something. And given the extremely sort of fractious political landscape, um, as you saw from the sort of uh, the, the, the left and the right caucus both saying it's a bad deal, that probably means it's a reasonable deal. What it's done effectively is to cap U.S. government spending at around a one but no flat this year, one percent increase next year, and that means that uh, things will continue to rumble along. But one should not forget that. Uh, it is, uh, as uh, McC Speaker McCarthy was saying, it, it's a divided uh, government. That's the way the founders of the U.S. set it up uh, to ensure that there would be you know, checks and balances, and both sides have had to give something. Uh, what it does mean, of course, is that the U.S., the short end of the U.S. Treasury market, should uh, be a much calmer place going forward. If uh, Biden and McCarthy are correct and this deal does win the approval of the House and the Senate in Congress, presumably the attention of investors, Gavin, goes back to the state of the U.S. economy, whether the U.S. economy is headed into a recession or not, and, of course, uh, where the Fed goes from here. Does it pause? Uh, will it indeed cut rates uh, sometime in 2024? What's your take on all of that? Well, as you say, uh, the U.S. economy is the major driver. And everything seems to indicate we're due for a big slowdown. Whether or not you actually end up with it being the official definition of a recession, which is two net consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, we don't know until well after the event. As you know, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually comes out about nine months after it actually started and says, oh, by the way, you've been in recession. Uh, but the inverted yield curve, the fact that short-term interest rates have been higher than long-term interest rates for most of the last nine months is about the best forecaster of what's going to happen in the economy. And we're starting to see a fairly major slowdown. If you look at a number of uh, indicators, they're showing weakness. Um, things like unemployment, people go, oh, well, we still have record low unemployment, uh, you know, the lowest in 50 years. It's a lagging indicator. So what you ought to expect, therefore, is the Fed is probably going to pause in June, which I think uh, Chair Powell made fairly plain, but also that they're going to wait and see. They said they're data dependent. If the data starts to come in weaker, you might yet see cuts in um, interest rates, but probably not until the end of the year, because the Fed, having got transitory inflation so wrong, wants to try to rebuild credibility by not cutting too soon. What do we make, Gavin, of the very narrow market breadth in the U.S. stock markets in a very different macro environment, i.e. a slowing U.S. Yeah. economy rather than an accelerating U.S. economy? We're back, nonetheless, to the situation where a small number of stocks, whether you call them the FANGs or you use another acronym now because there's a couple of different names in that group, but a very, very tiny group of stocks is responsible for all of the gains year to date on the S&P 500. You, you make the point that uh, the equal weighted S&P 500, which is an index that, uh, that investors can look at if they wish, is actually down so far this, uh, the, this year. What do we make of this very, very narrow market breadth? Well, all the technical uh, analysts will tell you it's a pretty dangerous situation. You want to have as broad a market uh, advance as you can. And if it's getting narrower and narrower, and as you were mentioning, we're effectively, it's what we used to call the fangs, and you now add things like Tesla and NVIDIA, uh, which, by the way, uh, you know that, that increase in its market capitalization of $200 billion, you know, after it mentioned uh, artificial intelligence several times, because, of course, its chips are going to be used in artificial intelligence. Uh, but, you know, that, that is not healthy market action. And effectively, uh, if we start to see some slowdown, uh, then we're likely to see these uh, half dozen stocks, dozen stocks or whatever, which are regarded as being quote unquote safe, start to roll over. And that's what happened in 2000, 2002, when you might remember, Paul, you know, after the initial internet bubble burst, everyone piled into things like Cisco and Sun Microsystems, Research in Motion, Intel, saying, oh, these are the blue chips, these are safe. And they actually 
ended up going down even more than the index because that's where everyone had been hiding. And in the end, they were not uh, immune to the economic slowdown and the fact that the people they were selling stuff to were having cut back on orders. So this is a pretty vulnerable situation for the US market. We've got about 60 seconds left. What's your advice to investors who are tantalized by the, the AI stocks that soared uh, last week, uh, NVIDIA and, and Marvell, am among others? Uh, should they be uh, buying into those shares? If you've got them, well done you, take some profits. Uh, because again, uh, you don't go up 25, 30% in one day or two days. You know, that is sentiment driven. So uh, if you have them, take some profits. And maybe you look at the stuff that hasn't moved as much. Uh, perhaps some of the things like energy and materials and financials, which we can talk about uh, in the Canadian context, perhaps um, after the break.